afternoon. Welcome to the first of our security seminar series for the spring semester. I hope all of you had a good holiday break and you're off to a good start in this new year and new millennium. For those of you in the room uh, who are taking the class for credit. There will be a quiz. There, <laughs> there will always be a quiz, but uh, actually uh, the class is pass-fail, so make sure that you've registered pass-fail, please, um, not letter grade. And each week there will be an attendance sheet that I will pass around that you need to sign. Uh, with that said, we can move along to our first speaker. Oh, I should also say, by the way, that uh, upcoming speakers and their uh, talk topics will be listed on our website. So if you visit the Sirius homepage, in the upper right corner, you'll see a link to the security seminar. Today's speaker is somebody that I've known for several years, and whenever there is a meeting where we're talking about building secure software, reliable software, uh, Gary seems to be there. Uh, and <laughs> I have nothing to say, but I am there. <laughs> usually a big help. Uh, <laughs> because we need to fill seats. Nobody seems to want to build secure software, but at least we have meetings on it. And uh, he is uh, currently uh, the CTO, the Vice President for Technology uh, for, um, uh, not CityGal, but, but Sigital, right. uh, which formerly was a reliable, um, uh, so reliable software technology. I know it's an oxymoron, but RST, well. reliable software. Uh, Gary has done remarkably well for someone who got his degrees from Indiana University. Uh, <laughs> Only one. <laughs> In cognitive science, no less. But uh, uh, certainly has uh, contributed a great deal to the field, has written uh, or co authored two books on uh, securing Java, or three books two. on securing Java, reliable software. He's uh, coming out with a new book a little later on this semester. Uh, material that well worth reading and the material that he's going to be talking about us today building secure software is well worth hearing so please join me in welcoming dr gary mcgraw thanks well thanks hello um, i want to make this talk as interactive as possible first of all a little sponsorship message this talk made possible by city gal i mean sigital um, where we do software risk management, and that means trying to make software actually behave, which turns out to be hard. Um, I want to make this talk as interactive as possible, so if you have questions, comments, snide remarks, I feel like a hamster in a little cage up here, but you know, throw stuff, ask questions, uh, and if you're staring at your TV screen, you should actually stare at the person who's in the room up here instead of the TV screen. But I understand that that's where the slides are, so. First slide, it's all about the software. Um, security is a funny thing because there are a lot of vendors out there and there are a lot of security practitioners out there who always claim that they have the silver bullet, that they know what the problem is and that their product or their cryptography library or their firewall will solve the problem. Unfortunately, all those vendors are almost always wrong. And in fact, if you take a look at why we have security problems in the first place, one interesting thing to note, and one radical statement that I would like to stand behind, is that really security problems in the end are mostly about the software, not all about the software. We got humans in the loop, so we always have social engineering and things like that. But soft, bad software accounts for a huge number of the security problems that you see out there today. And we're sort of applying Band-Aids to the problem through penetrate and patch and other means where we should really be trying to design software properly in the first place. So my talk today is not about network security, which I consider a solved problem, at least academically solved. Um, instead, it's about trying to find the biggest security risk out there and address that. And I would claim that the biggest risk is application code that people either write themselves or that make up things like network demons or web servers um, that are big problems that we have. And th that's often the weakest link in the chain. Everybody knows that software is getting more complicated than it ever was before. Um, software complexity is growing while at the same time our technology base for managing risk in software is not growing the same way. That means we've got a problem because the problem exists if you look at this little graph here which you can't see on the screens I see. Um, sorry about the resolution we had to adjust it to something tiny. Um, 
there's a gap between the complexity curve and the technology curve, and that gap means we've got a problem. The bigger that gap gets, the worse software is and the less capability we have for dealing with it. So software security is all about analyzing a piece of code or a design um, to understand what the security risks are. It's not penetration testing, it's not red teaming, it's not taking a piece of code and trying to test it after it's all the way done. Although that can play a role in some aspects of software risk management, the key idea is to think about security, reliability, dependability, availability, all the other illities while you're designing code so that you end up designing something that can be secure. One of the bigger, biggest problems today is that software development is in such a uh, nascent state that we're not even doing standard software engineering things like writing down what the requirements are or making specifications. I can't tell you how many clients come to us, and these are not the good clients. These are the ones that we, that we tell we don't have any you know, business for them. Uh, they come to us and they say, we've got this great thing that we just invented. We'd love to have you tell us whether it's secure or not, and we say, all right, we'll, we'll estimate how long it'll take. Why don't you give us your spec? And they say, spec? Well, we meant to do that. How about if you write the spec first and then you do the analysis on it? And this is serious. I mean, these are, these are people that are building the new economy stuff, lots of dot-coms out there building things this way. The e-business infrastructure people are particularly uh, guilty of this sort of thing. So the idea is that software is the Achilles heel in security today. And that if we thought more carefully about software engineering and about building security in properly, we'd make a lot of headway in trying to solve our security problem. So what are some common software security problems? Well, in the Unix world, we got SendMail that everybody likes to pick on. Um, Finger, FTP, login, LPR. In the Windows world, we have IIS. Um, Windows password security, VB scripting engines, and other things. These things were all designed without security in mind. And then somebody tried to leverage or tack security on at the end, and that doesn't work. So the question is, well, how do you do it right? Well, the key is designing things to be secure in the first place, but unfortunately, that's hard. So software attacks mirror attacks in the real world. Mirror what bad people do, theft and destruction and spying and forgery, all of those things. The difference is that on the net, it can all be automated. So, you know, what happens is you got somebody who's a very clever hacker, who's truly a hacker, but is a malicious hacker who creates a script, and then the script kiddies get it, and then we get things like the denial of service attacks, which today have been dusted off and reused again. Who'd they take down today? <coughs> Oh, they took down the, yeah, the, the undernet, undernet, the chat guys are, are down today because of DDoS stuff. And, you know, it's too bad that that's the case, but maybe if, if that software had been designed to withstand that sort of attack, then we wouldn't have such a big problem on our hands today. So the internet gives us, it, it takes the usual problem and it makes it harder because you can automate attacks, you can perform attacks from the comfort of your own living room or loft, as the case may be. You have instant technique propagation where if somebody thinks of a great attack, they put it out there and all of a sudden millions of people know how to do that. It's instant um, information flow. These are all things that exacerbate the problems that we have in software security. And then, um, of course, we could take advantage of that propagation in vendor land too, so you could theoretically get patches out and everybody could patch all their stuff and make some of these script kitties uh, irrelevant, but that doesn't work because most system administrators are overworked and they don't apply the patches because, you know, their system works and who the heck would want to break it just to get it to be more secure? You know, that might screw it up and it's sort of working now and I only had to reboot it twice yesterday, you know. Everybody knows how sysadmins think. So who is the bad guy? Well, bad guys are um, full disclosure zealots, um, malicious hackers. There are good hackers too. You know, there's the whole hacker versus cracker thing going. I, I like to use hacker as a guy who's a 
clever programmer, sort of like MacGyver is a clever s guy who can build stuff out of bubble gum and duct tape and everything else, you know. Hackers do the same thing. They don't, they don't typically tend to be software engineers, but they still create some cool stuff. Um, I'm not into full disclosure at all, by the way, and here's why. Um, over the last few years, a lot of holes have been discovered in the Java virtual machine, and I've been involved in, in discovering and looking at some of those holes. And one of the things that we decided early on was not to publish the code. And as a result of that, there's only one Java attack applet that's serious out there today. It's the brown orifice attack that we didn't find. Somebody else found that, and they published the code. But other than that, there are no serious mobile code attacks based on Java because we told people about the risks and we told them what the problems were like. And if you're smart and you read our book, you can write the code if you want to. But nobody's done it. So full disclosure for me is a bad idea. Got script kitties. These are people who know how to hit return. You know, they get a they get an attack script and they hit return, pick their target. Um, we got some criminals out there, malicious insiders, business competition, police, press, terrorists, intelligence agencies. This little picture here is the guy who actually wrote Melissa. I forget his name. What's his name here? David L. Smith who uh, was assisted men at some unnamed large research lab. Interesting story, check it out. So the problem is a, a growing problem. If you look at Security Focus, which is Bug Track's uh, archive place now, you can see that in 98 there were a certain number of vulnerabilities and more in 99 and even more in 2000 and this trend's gonna just go up and up because software is becoming ubiquitous and it's doing more and more important things and so as that happens, you know, we'll have more attacks and more vulnerabilities. I think penetrate and patch is a lousy idea. Steve Belvin has a great quote that says, any program, no matter how innocuous it seems, can harbor security holes. I thus have a firm belief that everything is guilty until proven innocent. And what penetrate and patch is, is in the field analysis by bad guys. <coughs> Happens too late. As I said before, patches are often ignored. Sysadmins don't want to break their system that's working right now. The patches sometimes are slammed out so fast that they've got holes of their own, which is hilarious. You know, so you, you, you get everybody to focus on that part of, say, a broken demon, and then you break it and make it obviously broken for everyone. Now, there are a bunch of problems with that. It's much better to create architectures with security in mind use some sound software engineering, um, and have some external assessment. And that doesn't mean you have to pay some high-priced consultant from Sigital. What that means is if you're designing a system, you should have somebody else analyze it because nobody tries to design stuff to be insecure, but it turns out that having more pairs of eyes look at a piece of code, thinking about security is often a good idea. So penetrate and patch is bad, but it sort of works. And if you look at this curve, it doesn't look like you can see it on these screens. Are your screens the same size as mine? Same resolution, so it's sort of white. You can see nothing on this, so we'll skip it. But the idea is that um, attacks go up this hill, and then the patch gets released, and then the attacks keep going up, and then eventually they drop off. And the question would be, well, why? Is that just an artificial uh, effect of a new hole being discovered that's the latest, greatest hole that people are using? But these curves are based on some analysis of, that CERT did that was recently published in IEEE Computer uh, this month, I think. So the environment turns out to be important too. And you need to be, think carefully about what kinds of technologies you use. Um, for example, C versus Java is a very important choice. Now we've made a lot of noise about why Java is insecure and you know, we, we got the Java security stuff going on. What are you gonna do here? <laughs> um, oh boy, oh boy. I'm going to terminate this video so it looks better. Ah, good idea. Oh. Oh. Yes, so C was designed, thanks. C was designed with efficiency in mind and not security. And if you think about C, it's just like, you know, assembly language on steroids, very low level. You can get to the metal if you want. You can code bits. Um, Java, on the other hand, was designed with security in mind. It has notions like type safety and secure class loading and stack-based access control uh, built right into it. 
And so Java is often a much better choice for building a system that has to be secure than C or C++. And in fact, if you look at the standard stupid attacks based on things like buffer overflows, why are buffer overflows still a problem? Well, because we have lousy languages like C and everyone uses them. And I bet you they teach C as a first language at Purdue, don't they? No, yes, what do they teach? Java. Java, oh, you guys, you're so leading edge. It's like watching TV on desks and stuff. <laughs> very cool. Now, that's very good um, because C, I mean, if you look at K and R, right, it says, here's the get s function and here's how to use it. And if you're a security person on that page, you just shake your head and go, that system call shouldn't exist. It should just never, ever be used, period. And that's what leads to things like buffer overflow attacks. You know, things like Genie and the latest cool technology of the day. Genie has no security in it at all. Um, and there's authentication that's based solely on IP and we all know about DNS. Um, I don't know. All these things are important and choosing which technology you're gonna, you're gonna use turns out to be a critical part of software security as well. So why is this hard? Well, there are three major factors that make software security hard. And they're the same three factors that lead to the malicious code problem being a bigger problem than it was in the past. The three factors are connectivity. Everything is connected together. It's all on the net. Extensibility, where we've got systems like Java and other mobile code systems where we can take code and change our environment on the fly. That makes things way more complicated. And then plain old complexity. Because when you have network distributed systems, it gets much harder to design them properly. Uh, and we've got, we're gonna have a new set of problems once we get rid of C. <laughs> yeah, right. Once C sort of goes away, let's pretend it goes away, what's the biggest problem that's gonna be left? Well, probably race conditions and other time-based attacks. So connectivity, extensibility, and complexity are sort of the trinity of trouble making software harder than ever. There are a lot of subtleties. There's too much to know. There's not even one good source of information for software security. Spaff mentioned that I was working on a new book. It's called Building Secure Software Like This Talk. And it's got, you know, this is like one bazillionth of the material in the book. But the, the weird thing about it is there are zero books on software security right now. That's I don't know why. Seems to me it's an important thing. Maybe that's why we have a big security problem on our hands today, or maybe we got caught with our pants down. I'm not sure. Programming is hard. The tools are lousy. There wasn't even a tool for scanning for using bad system calls until we wrote one and released it. It's called ITS4. ITS4, by the way, stands for It's the Software Stupid Security Scanner. And it's very simple, kind of glorified grep-based approach that scans through C and C++ code looking for things like get s or, or other bad calls that you shouldn't use and saying, gee, you know, you ought to reconsider using some other call instead of whatever. Popular languages are awful. C and C++ are awful. And the only constant is change. So these are all things that make software risk management really hard. I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about security risks because if you understand what the problems are when you're designing and coding, then maybe you won't make the same mistakes that we've been making for 20 years. Um, so I'm going to highlight two of the five biggies. The five biggies are there, up, buffer overflow, random number generation are the two I'm going to talk about, crypto misuse, trust problems like input validation and authentication problems. Those are like the big five software security problems. Um, and I'm going to talk about the buffer overflow and random number generation just briefly. The dreaded buffer overflow is uh, really quite a simple problem. It's like you got a glass and you got a bunch of water and you pour more water into the glass than fits in the glass so it spills on the table, right? Except for the table has all this exposed wiring laying around. So sometimes people die. So C, <laughs> C lets you do dumb things like allocate some bytes, however many you want. And if it's not terminated with a zero, you know, why on earth did they do this? Well, because Back in the day, computers didn't come with 128 megs or 512 megs or a gig or whatever. 
they came with 48K. I remember, because I still have one, Apple II, 48K. And you had to be careful of every bit that you use. Interestingly enough, a lot of those issues are cropping up today in embedded systems, too. So the question is how to high-level languages like Java and low-level needs like C, uh, like embedded systems, cohere. Yeah. Yeah, write bloated code. Bloated code is good. <laughs> wise guy. Here's a wise guy. No, um, bloated code is bad. But sometimes coding to the metal um, can bite you. And it's okay to do when you need to do it. Uh, and, and in fact, a lot of people that use C write fine code. But the problem is that we're providing, we're, we're giving, we're putting risks right into the very languages that most people are using today without telling them what the risks are. So another possibility is that we educate everybody about what system calls to use and which ones not to use and why, right? And then they can use C because it's very powerful. But always with power comes risk, and you got to just make that trade off yourself. So that's the real answer. And, and uh, you know, I'm a scheme guy, so what do I know about languages? <laughs> Functional programming for everyone, yes. Uh, but when I write connectionist models, I write them in C because they're iterative. It's a register-based approach, and that's C is the language to use for that. So it depends on what you're doing. T the buffer overflow is the most pervasive problem today in terms of reported bugs and in terms of holes that are exploited. And in fact, if you look at this data, this is data from CERT. This idea was an idea that Dave Wagner had. He published it a paper at NDSS uh, a couple of years ago. And I just kept tracking the data. But you can see the proportion in blue of CERT alerts that are related to buffer overflows. And it's all always over 50%, still over 50%. That is ridiculous. And this year, it's going to be even bigger, probably because of the, um, s the print format stuff. Overflows there. So the buffer overflow, there's a new way to do it. So everybody's going to start doing it that way. Now, this ought to give us a clue that, you know, we got a problem in the very language that you're, we're using and we need to figure out how to avoid that problem. So there's two main flavors of buffers out there. There's heap allocated buffers and there's stack allocated buffers. Um, and stack overflows are easier. And so they're way more common. But you can do heap overflows, too. So a lot of people say, well, I only malloc and new, so I'm cool. Um, but actually, that's wrong. Because heap overflows are possible. They're just very hard. And people always go for, bad guys go for the easiest route. Um, although, you could argue that the people that write these buffer overflow attacks have to really know what they're doing. And they do. It's not an uh, instantaneous, easy attack to carry out. So what happens when a buffer overflows? Well, Sometimes programs just do weird stuff. And you're just using a program, it does some weird stuff. Dr. Watson says, weird stuff. And you go, oh, weird stuff. I'll just kill it and start it again, right? And that may be a buffer overflow happening that, that somebody didn't catch in testing. Sometimes programs just crash, fail completely. Sometimes programs keep running with no noticeable problems at all. So how do you find buffer overflow problems? Well, you can look. In the assembly, you can look in the source code for stupid system calls. There are lots of ways to find them. But it's very hard, the point of this slide is it's very hard to spot these problems through standard pro testing. You know, if, you're, if you're doing standard testing, weird stuff may happen. You, go, you might go, oh, that was, I don't know why that happened. We'll skip that one. And you know, you know testers. <laughs> Enough said. So what are the implications? Well, sometimes you can use a buffer overflow to overwrite important data in memory, like privilege fields or password fields or whatever. Um, but the real ones that are, that are more important are uh, stack overflows and smashing the stack. And these allow you to run arbitrary code. So how does that work? Well, you got a stack because you want to know what calls what calls what. And stack machines allow us to do recursion in a very elegant way way um, today with C. Very common computational approach. Uh, almost every machine uses stacks now. Even Java's got a stack in the middle of it. Um, and, and if you look at languages like ML and Scheme, they get turned into stack-based architecture in the end, too, because that's the way chips work. 
So it's a very common computational approach. And the problem in C is that you get local variables and other stuff stuck on the stack. And if you write stuff into the local variable space just so you can overwrite the return address in another stack frame. And you do that to, to make it jump to some code that you've put somewhere else. And that's the way you smash a stack. So you're just spilling water in a certain way so that you're overwriting the return address and running your own code, and then you win. And that's the way these buffer overflow things work. And, and they're so common. It's ridiculous how common they are. So there's some good and bad system calls. There's lots of, we go into, you know, gory detail about overflows and stack smashing stuff uh, in our writing. And in fact, if you want to check it out ahead of time, IBM Developer Works has been publishing a bunch of articles about software security that we've written. And all the buffer overflow stuff is in there, including, you know, some exploit code that you need to actually smash the stack all the way on popular architectures. Because we think people ought to know what the problem is instead of just sort of not really knowing. So instead of things like get s, use f get s. Instead of stir copy, use stir in copy. Instead of stir cat, use stir in cat. You know, there's, there, there are things that you can do uh, to write code more defensively in C if you have to use C. And that's, that's okay. Uh, but even some of the things that we suggest that you use instead can be can have problems too. And in fact, you can do stuff like with stir copy to make sure that the argument's the right length before you pass it in. You know, write some code up front to check arguments. And a lot of people do that. But sometimes, you know, when I get lazy, I'll just use one and say, oh yeah, I'll go fix it later, <laughs> and then forget to go back and fix it later. And that turns out to be a very common problem. So it's better just not to use those at all. You can use simple tools like the it's for tool to look for these things. And so, you know, that's that's a pretty reasonable tool to use. If you guys want to get it's for, you can go to sigital.com slash it's for, it's free. It's, uh, it's almost open source. It's open-ish source. So you can use it for non-commercial use as much as you want, and you can apply it to your own code. Even if you're selling your code, that's cool with us. You just can't sell the tool. Another risk, this is uh, another biggie, is random number generation. Everybody knows computers are deterministic machines. Uh, they're very bad at behaving randomly. Uh, Microsoft manages to make them behave randomly. But I don't know how they do that. But if you run this code right here, which calls rand, which you would figure would give you a random number, you get the same behavior every time. You get these little numbers that are down at the bottom because you're seeding this thing that's really uh, not a random number generator. It's really a pseudo random number generator. And there's a big difference between those two things. So what do we got? Well, we got these pseudo random number generators that create a pattern of output that's statistically random, but it's a deterministic pattern. It's the same every time. And if you know the seed, you know what the pattern's gonna be from then on. And they're supposed to be reproducible. That's what that function's for. Unfortunately, a lot of people that write in C, never, nobody ever told them that. So when they need a random number for like a crypto key, they just use RAND. That's bad. Or they want to shuffle some cards, they just use RAND, you know, which is great until you're playing for money. Actually, it is great when you're playing for money too. <laughs> so in security critical cases, if you can guess the seed, you can get the whole sequence. So brute force attacks work pretty well, especially since the seeds tend to be 32-bit integers, not a very huge number. So you got two to the 32 possible seeds, but it turns out that if you look at the output and compare it to the results from each seed, if you pre-compute it, weed out the seeds, you can do that. So you can build a table of all possible things. There are better ways to do that. But people don't seed with random numbers, right? They seed with stuff like, the system clock. Now the system clock isn't very random because time's not very random. And if you know sort of when they seeded things, that really cuts your space down pretty significantly. Um, and you can often find the random number sequence that people are using. So informed guesses dramatically reduces the search. Not that this space is very big, incidentally, you could do that with a distributed computer 
model with lots of PCs that are just sitting around with extra cycles doing a SETI at home type thing, you know, let's crack crypt random number generation keys. This turns out to be a huge issue on embedded devices and smart cards and other things where it's very hard to get any entropy for an entropy pool. So here's an example of not random. This is something that we did at Sigital. There's a game, there's a couple of guys at work that like to play poker. There's like five or six guys. They play poker all the time with real cards. And then one day, one guy found that you could play poker on the web too. So he started playing on the web. And he was our sysadmin, by the way. And then, and then he told a guy in the software security group, hey, you know, there's this poker on the web. You ought to check it out. And the guy went over, he started playing. And he started thinking, huh, I wonder how they shuffle their cards. And so he went to the website and he checked it out and they had a fact. They said, we bet you wonder how we shuffle our cards. Well, we use this algorithm. And they put the algorithm <laughs> and in there was a call to like Delphi Pascal random number generator. Seated with the clock. Not only that, their server would let you query the clock and find out what time it was on their server. <laughs> so we're like, cool. You know, because we're thinking we'd have to build this distributed thing because we were talking about how we were going to hack this online poker stuff. And then we found out that we didn't have to do anything. That they did all the work for us. So we took their algorithm and uh, we built this a little GUI, which you can't see very well. And what you had to do was type in the cards that you see. See, it's Texas Hold'em, so you get a couple of face up. Other people get some cards face up and face down. And then there's a flop in the middle. I'm not going to explain the game. But the gist of it is you get enough data, and you get the clock close enough within a couple minutes, and you press show cards, and poof, all the cards show up. And you know who's going to win. And then you decide whether to fold or hold. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'll fold this time. Or you know, you can bet them way up if you know you have something that's not very uh, usual thing that you get. Uh, fun stuff to do. So we, this was a little crack that we did. Um, instead of sure. instead of making a million dollars, we told CNN, which may be about the same eventually. Who knows? <laughs> so here's another not random. Netscape SSL. SSL session keys were generated by using MD5 to hash the time of day, the process ID, and the parent's process ID in the Unix system. This was the Solaris version. Um, and what happened is the seed goes from 128-bit, well, the 128-bit encryption turns out to just be, at best, 47-bit encryption. And that's brute forcible. Um, not instantaneously, but brute forcible makes it within the realm of actually attacking. Um, and that's the way, so a little bit of cleverness reduces that substantially even further, and you can get real keys out in about 25 seconds. This is work that was done by Dave Wagner at Berkeley. Yeah? What version of Netscape? Oh, this was an early, early version. Mm. Netscape SSL is no longer broken. Um, this was, I think, in 97. In this way. What? In this way. In this. No longer broken. Oh, no longer broken in this way, Spaff points out. It's broken in other ways than that. Well, how do you be random? Is this, does that mean I have seven minutes left on here or eight, 800 minutes left? I'm going to have to animate the last few hundred slides. Sorry. So, you get some unpredictable bits and you hash them. Now, where do you get unpredictable bits? Well, that turns out to be hard. You can maybe measure stuff in the physical world. You can point cameras at lava lamps. You know, if you looked at Lava Rand, which is very cool. The only problem with Lava Rand is it's on the web, so everybody's looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> That's not random anymore. Um, you can look at heat signatures. Intel's got a little fancy thing they do with that on their new chip, although it's not clear that that's actually being manufactured anymore. Uh, and there's some software sources too, like kernel state information, uh, network traffic. Um, Dev random's pretty good in Linux, actually. Um, so if you, if you need a good source of uh, uh, entropy pool, Dev random's great. And Yaro promises to be a pretty reasonable source for randomness too as soon as it gets done. There are a couple of people that have, that have done reference implementations of Yaro. We're almost done with one at Sigital, but it's in bad shape because the Yaro guys keep changing the spec. So we developed to a spec and they said, no, it's over here. No, it's over there. So who knows when that'll be done. What is Yaro? 
Yarrow is a, a random randomness algorithm. So here's some other common, those are two examples of software security errors. Things that if you're a programmer or an architect, you need to know about so that you don't just make the same stupid mistakes that everybody has been making for the last 20 years. There, there are other common pitfalls too, like poor authentication and input checking, especially with things like CGI. Uh, race conditions where you check some access and then there's a, there's a space between checking the access privilege and actually using the thing that you check and there's a space that the attacker can get in between. Bad crypto protocols, secrets that live too long, grabbing, you know, SUID and holding it forever, um, erasing stuff that's not really erased, believing people, that's the best one because <laughs> that leaves you susceptible to social engineering. Of physical security failures, covert channels. These are all classic so security pitfalls in software. So what are some things that you can do? Well, I've got some like high level, um, how many minutes do I have left? 10. I got some high level uh, advice and I'm gonna go through it real quick. One slide a minute. Guiding principle number one, identify and secure the weakest links. Now that sounds like a duh. But you know, a lot of people do things like lock their door and leave their window open, you know, or lock, don't lock their car door and leave the keys in the ignition is more like what we usually do. But most people that create software don't think about security at all. And one of the good things you need to do is think about security and realize that you can't be perfect, so you gotta go for the low hanging fruit, the obvious. Did you know that most cars have locks that, you know, there's only like 10 keys for most car brands. So you can, you can go look for certain kinds of cars that are like yours and try your key and sometimes it works. <laughs> <laughs> it's really surprising. I think they've changed that, but in the 80s it was especially possible. Um, so if you just lock your door and you forget about everything else, then the bad guys will kick in your door or drill the lock or break a window or pick the lock. And a lot of people believe today that cryptography and firewalls are all there has, you know, that's all you need for software security. And I can't tell you how many design meetings I've been at where people say, you know, they take their whiteboard design and they throw in a couple of firewalls and they say, we'll link in Certicom stuff here and we're done. And, and don't really think carefully about what are the risks and which ones do we have to deal with. There's no such thing as 100% security, but you should definitely identify the risks and go after the biggest one first. Practice defense in depth. Manage risk with multiple strategies. You know, locks work much better if you have alarms on them. When, so when people try to drill them out, something happens. Redundant subsystems are a good idea. Be reluctant to trust. Think about things like, well, hmm, it says it's that IP address, or it says it's this server name, is it really? Or gee, maybe we shouldn't link in that piece of COT software that's such a disaster, after all, into our system. Bad guys are way more resourceful than a lot of people think, because there's a lot of information out there. And you can find, uh, there are a lot of problems that are discovered that really don't get publicized until it's kind of too late. You know, and by the time CERT gets around to putting out an alert, geez, you know, <laughs> nobody's even using the attack anymore because the vendors finally figured it out. Um, don't mimic everybody else. Common protocols often turn out to be fundamentally flawed, especially if they haven't been checked by the security community. And realize that trust is a transitive thing. If you trust, if you have a program that you trust and you let it have some access to your program, sometimes that program will let other people do the same thing to your code. And that's something that you gotta really think about carefully. Um, how do you limit trust? Once you let it out of the box, what happens? Uh, a classic example of that is, you know, having a, a shell-less system that has an editor that lets you spin a shell, right? Gotta love that, very common. Remember that hiding secrets is very hard and security by obscurity doesn't work at all. Just ask Netscape, you know, who tries to, to obscure your pop password uh, using a fixed key and XOR and you know that little magic decoder ring technology. That's the way your password, if you allow Netscape to store your pop password, that's the way it stores it. 
and there's all sorts of code that can easily get that password today. And I bet you, you know, I'm lazy, so I use the same password everywhere, even though I know I'm not supposed to. Know that uh, secrets can be inferred from behavior and that reverse engineering isn't very hard and they're great tools that do that too. Follow the principle of least privilege. Good idea in the 70s, good idea today. Don't give out more privilege than you have to. And give it out for short periods of time. You know, it's kind of like that bathroom pass that they had in grade school. You, you don't just give out the bathroom pass to whoever wants it and let them keep it forever for the rest of the year. Right? They got to bring the bathroom pass back, and there's only one of them. So don't just have your program have endless bathroom passes. <laughs> don't hand out the key to your office. And provide data on a need to know basis. This is a biggie. Fail and recover securely. Especially in object oriented systems where you got exceptions being thrown. Um, exception handling turns out to be very important, and it's something that people overlook a lot. And you can attack most programs because they fail in a stupid way. Uh, it's a great attack avenue. In fact, if, you're, if you sort of have to red team something, you should start out uh, looking at error handling. Compartmentalize. Limit exposure. Look stuff like Chirrut, which has all sorts of problems. Or use different keys for different devices. Um, just like jail cells or chambers in submarines, not that it helps the Russians any, or money in your wallet, you, know, you need to think about compartmentalization. Keep it simple. This is a good one. It contradicts the defense in depth idea, but you know, a lot of people out there that are doing hardcore development get all psyched about you know, the latest, greatest, cool thing. Like they want to use EJB2, yada, yada, or they want to use Java message system, or they want to use whatever, just because it's cool, instead of because they need to do it. And it's important to think about um, simplicity. The simpler you can make your system, the better off you are. And I'm not talking about the user interface, although that's important too. Um, in a strange quirk of fate, the simpler you make your user interface, the more complicated your code has to be often, which is bizarre, but true. Which means that if you make it simple for users, then often you got all this crazy complicated stuff going on behind the scenes. Uh, that's, that's problematic. Keep trust to yourself. Um, if you give out more information than you need to, you're just asking for trouble. You know, like logins provide the OS version info. They don't need to do that. Uh, lie. <laughs> sure, I'm Mozilla. Yeah. You know, misinformation doesn't hurt. And be skeptical. Uh, I don't have to tell you guys this because in academia you get taught to be skeptical the whole time. But all those people out there in business land, they forget. And they believe, they really want to believe because the vendors say, we can solve your problem for a mere 100,000. And they're like, yes, my problem is solved. You know, and they're being lied to. There's some great snake oil facts. There's one at interhack.net that you should check out. Um, question all assumptions and choices, uh, especially when it comes to your own code, because it, it's really, really easy to get short-sighted about your own code. The guy that I'm writing this book with um, wrote the GNU Mailman program, and he wrote it before he knew anything about security, and since then we've gone back to look at the code just for fun. <laughs> And it's just riddled with disastrous problems, some of which have been fixed and some of which haven't been fixed because nobody has time to fix them yet. So how long do I have? Three seconds? Three minutes. Three minutes. The classic trade-off. Get stuff done or be secure. This is why being a security person is kind of hard because, you know, Security people are in the business of making sure nobody gets anything done. If nobody ever gets anything done, that's cool, because it's secure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in the 10-foot hole that you've pointed out, that's like you bury the computer in there, you fill it with concrete. Very, very secure, and also pretty much useless. So the question is, how do you balance those things off? And you know, the answer is different depending on what the code has to do. So that's what makes software security hard because you can have software engineering that's killer hardcore like space shuttle code that costs 20,000 bucks a line to produce. 
or you can have .com code that doesn't even compile yet, right? And the users are going to make it compile. <laughs> That's a great business model. And so <laughs> you got everything in between. And the question is, where on that spectrum do you fit? Which, you know, how much security is enough? And which methods should we use and which ones should we not use? And this trade-off is just a classic trade-off. So what was Java's answer? Well, Java's answer is add as much functionality as you can while still trying to manage security risks. And the thing has just gone through massive changes since JDK 102 all the way to 2. Um, but Java, .NET, all this stuff, mobile code hasn't caught on yet. It's gonna. You know, the stuff is ahead of its time. And in the next five years, nobody will say mobile code because all code will be mobile. Be like saying e-business, you know. <laughs> all business is e-business. And in the future, all code's gonna be mobile code. I betcha. So things like Java and .NET and all these sandboxing models that we're working on today are gonna be more and more important. Spend some time learning that stuff now and it'll help you out down the road big time. So here's what's happened with Java back in the old days. You can't really read that, but at the top is JDK 102. And in this book we wrote in 96 called Java Security, we made a mistake. And we said, it's really about applets versus applications. Wrong, wrong, wrong. It just so happened that applets were always untrusted and applications were always trusted. And it was really about trust. But we screwed up when we said it was about applets versus applications and people still say that today. Sorry, that's our fault. Um, JDK 1.1 is where things began to get slightly more complicated where you could have an applet that was signed, but it was still kind of this applets versus applications thing going on, right? You could have code that was signed that was allowed out of the sandbox. Now notice that the top two parts there have black and white. It was binary security. Either you're fully trusted or you're fully not trusted. And that's easy to understand, so people used it. And then Li Gong created a beautiful architecture for Java 2 that's so complicated that nobody uses it. And it's a shades of gray policy where you just have code and yeah, I might be sort of partially trusted, yeah, it belonged to my mom once kind of code. Or fully trusted code, you know, yeah, well I don't know, I don't trust anybody fully. But all the way from untrusted to fully trusted and policy defines how the virtual machine behaves with respect to that code. Very complicated model, but I bet you a model that's gonna play a very important role in the future, in a few years, especially when we get mobile embedded devices everywhere and we don't just run code on boxes like this. You know, we're at the very, very beginning of distributed computing for most users because in the Microsoft environment like I'm running now, code behind the scenes is actually distributed. There's a lot of DLLs and there's all sorts of message passing and things are shared. You know, there's no such thing as PowerPoint the program. It's not like a big program. It's like a bazillion, gazillion DLLs and they're shared with all the other office stuff. But it's all geographically located on this machine. Well, in the future, that won't be the case. There'll be components everywhere. And what did Les Lamport say? You know, distributed systems are ones in which a computer you didn't even know existed can screw your whole system up. I don't <laughs> think he said screw up, but you know, that's the gist of it. Um, and uh, that's the future. So what do you do to secure Java? Well, you gotta secure the platform, and you gotta secure all the code that arrives too, because it changes the environment when it gets there. That makes things tricky. So take home message. Security is really about risk management. And there's no such thing as 100% security. You gotta make these trade-offs. You gotta figure out how, what the balance is right. These have to be decisions that are driven by business, really. And it's time, actually, we're seeing this all over the place. Business geeks are driving, the business people are driving the decisions. Um, and that means they need to be informed about what the risks are. So sound software engineering is a good idea and we need to do more of that. Maybe you can create security guidelines and I'll leave these slides with you so you can put them somewhere. But guidelines aren't perfect because, you know, if they're applied by some, no offense, but 20 year old Anderson consultant person who doesn't know what they're doing 
Oh, they're not Anderson anymore. What are they? Accenture. Accenture, Accenture yeah. City gal. <laughs> if they don't know what they're doing, they're going to follow along and check boxes, and it will not give you what you need, which is a real expertise-driven approach. Uh, got a whole nother talk on open source and closed source, um, which is a good one. <laughs> and I would love to get into a rant about that, but there's no time. Oh, wrong way. It's, oh, did you? And security risk analysis, there's a chapter in the new book about that stuff actually. Security risk analysis is a good idea. You gotta really start with a risk analysis of the architecture and not by trying to red team or crack some code, which is the standard approach today. A lot of security consultants that are doing application security will just bang on the front door. And you know what? They'll break it every time. So if you want to look good as a security manager, oh, we broke everything this year. You can do that, but in the end, it won't make you more secure. It's kind of like hiring you know, VPs if you're a network, like CBS. <laughs> programming VPs, they say, yes, great show, yes, great show. And you can hire a consultant that says, yes, we could break it, and here's how. But what you really need to do is step back, look at the architecture, and think about the architecture. A tool like It's4 will look at the system calls that you're using, but it doesn't look at the architecture, so it's kind of like a brick probe. I see you toying with your hat. Using good bricks, using good bricks is important, but you know what? The architecture is more important. When you're trying to keep the rain out, you better have a roof. And most people are looking at what bricks they use, and it's just like a pile of bricks with no roof or no walls. Seriously. So you gotta, you got to do architecture, too. Finally, here's some pointers. Um, building secure software has actually been turned in. It's in the review process now. So the manuscript is done. A lot of the material that is going into that book has already been distributed by IBM at Developer Works. So there's a URL there. It's IBM.com Developers to Security. And there's a lot of stuff about that we've talked about today. Random number generation, stack smashing, uh, race conditions, other things like that, the guidelines. And then uh, we have a software security group at Sigital. We also have a lab that's the science lab. So we do academic and scientific research there. We have a commercial software security group where people actually work on like Visa's software and the Fed Reserve software, Motorola stuff to make it be secure. And you know what's weird? We don't have any competition. <laughs> I wish we did because then people would be doing software security properly and it needs to be done properly. There's my email address. If you send me email, I might answer it. <laughs> Questions? I have one to start. Okay. You uh, uh, said at one point in the talk that you're really against full disclosure. Mm hmm And you said that... Yeah, I... IBM. <laughs> <laughs> just, just curious about that. Well, I'm against full disclosure of a, vulner of a vulnerability. No. Uh, okay. The stuff that we have at IBM is uh, exploit that you can use in a stack smashing attack to learn about it, but it doesn't show you, you know, apply this this way to this particular program. You see what I mean? So there's a big difference. So we described um, all of the holes in the Java Virtual Machine very carefully. And if, you're, if you read the book, like chapter six, I think, I mean, it's all on the web, by the way. It's securingjava.com for free. So just check it out. Um, you can actually write the exploits, but we never produced the code for other people. We never distributed it. And it lives on a CD in my drawer, or actually in my filing cabinet that locks. That's the only copy of it. And so, you know, as a result, those things haven't been spread around. I, I don't think those two positions are too counter. They're sort of, I'm a little torn. It's like, you know, am I a Linux guy? Well, I'm running PowerPoint. You know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to use AmbiWord or whatever that thing is. Star Office, yeah. How do you propose to do uh, independent testing of things like intrusion detection or verifying that the patch yeah, it turns out to be a very hard problem. Um, the, oh, sorry. The question is, how do you propose to do independent verification of things like intrusion detection systems and patches? patches? Uh, and the answer is, uh, it turns out to be extremely hard to verify what software is going to do. 
because you have the dreaded environment problem where software behaves one way over here, but you put it over here and it behaves completely differently. And this turns out to be a huge problem because people are taking these 20 year old systems that ran great on a proprietary network, no security problems, and they're putting them on the net. They're internetizing them. And they don't realize that the threat model is completely different. So environment matters. And the answer is very carefully. <laughs> but there's no magic bullet to, to uh, specifically in terms of you being against closure. Right. How do you uh, you the two? I, I don't reconcile them. You argue that I'm a conflicted and confused individual. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> yes. Yes. So do you find that you have more security problems with implementation issues or overall design? Architecture. Architecture. Big time. Absolutely. Um, huge, 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 huge. I can't emphasize that enough. And guess what we don't teach <laughs> at all? Architecture. And you know what's hard? I was trying to write stuff down about architecture and you can't do it. I mean, it's really, really hard. You just get into these sort of sweeping generalizations like make it simple because it takes experience. It's weird, it's kind of like a craft. You, know, you need to be an apprentice for a while and see situations and build up your own experience. And uh, it's a hard thing to teach in a classroom. Uh, what about design patterns? Have you seen that? Has that yeah. had an on, on security as far as design? As not really? Or? Not really. Not, not that I know of. I'm not a big, huge fan of design patterns. You know, I'm, I'm more of a languages geek, so I would much rather have an elegant language um, than try to use a bad language better. That sort of makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wait, one other thing, though. Uh, I believe that object-oriented design is not the panacea that everybody claims that it is. And in fact, it makes it very easy to write thoroughly confusing code that no one can ever understand except for you. So, you know, the idea of abstraction is a great idea, but I don't think we've pulled it off quite right with uh, object orientation today, and it's not clear to me that things like meta-object protocols and other such stuff like aspect-oriented programming, which we're working on, I'm, I'm doing some research on that now, um, will be an answer. So, yeah. Yeah, I have a technical question. You you said earlier on that uh, bu buffer overflow doesn't yield to um, standard testing uh, procedures. Sometimes it, it can. Sometimes it can. Yep. So I, it, technically, is uh, the buffer overflow problem uh, you know formally testable? It it's not formally testable because in order to really make sure that a buffer can be overflowed, you have to do dynamic testing. And there are a couple of ways you can do it. We did some work that was published at S&P in 96, I believe, and it was about this fault injection tool that would overflow a buffer. And you, you just point at the buffer and say, overflow that and see what happens. It's an interesting academic exercise. But the question was then, well, could that ever really happen? Does it go back to the inputs in such a way that that could ever happen? And the answer was, we don't know. <laughs> And that's not very satisfying. So it didn't turn out to be, you know, super colossal great work. It was just interesting work. Um, but then what you, what you have is this sort of pyramid that you build, all, starting from things like do nothing, where you have all, every line is potential vulnerabilities, to use grep, where you at least find the bad system calls, to use something like its4, which is better than grep, uh, to use static analysis with control flow and data flow, but it's still static, mind you, to finally, the sort of holy grail, well, do some dynamic testing. And if you apply those in a logical fashion from the bottom up, then you can build an exploit engine. Um, and we've actually done that at Sigital. <laughs> but we, we're not giving it away yet. <laughs> First, we've got to find some more online gambling. <laughs> yeah. Um, it seems that like companies could you know, develop a lot of policies and guidelines for auditing their code and stuff. But there's a lot of companies now who basically startups who are formed for the sole purpose of being bought out. Right. Know, as soon as possible. Right. And it seems like this conflicting issue that you know, even though this large company has you know great policies in mind, but then they you know pay millions of dollars for this company and the software they you know is it, in your experience have you do companies audit that code? No. Or do they just kind of just no, and, and we have we have actually have a rule for our sales guys, which is no dot coms. Not only that, they don't pay their bills. <laughs> so that helps. And uh, I, I hope, I really hope that this dot-com meltdown that we're in now will do us some good. I think it's a needed correction, and I think that the people that are just 
you know, bullshitting their way through it are going to disappear, hopefully. Uh, and we'll be left with better quality software in the end. The other thing that's driving it is that um, bigger companies that have something to lose, like equity or brand, brand exposure, are beginning to get into their internet strategy phase. And they're building a lot more software. There's software embedded in like chemical manufacturing, process control, trains, brakes. You know, these are big companies that you, you know who they are. You know, Visa, their smart card stuff. Those guys don't screw around. They're not just like making crappy code and throwing it and see if it sticks against the wall. <laughs> um, and and I, I think that actually, if you look at the way the market is, Microsoft, everybody derides them for producing bad code. I think that's totally wrong. They produce perfect code for their market, <laughs> right? Because we were geeks and we'd go control, alt, delete, bitch, bitch, wine, wine, here's 30 bucks, you know? And we kept paying for it. And, and it, their code was just bad enough, but the market has shifted. And now that we have enterprise market and people with serious brand exposure and think people like NASDAQ, they're very concerned about using Microsoft's stuff in their enterprise, right? So Microsoft is going to step up to the plate and make higher quality stuff. I'll bet you. Because they're smart. <laughs> One more question. Zero more questions. Thank you. Thank you. Much.